Chandrasekhar and uh, there are other people on the other side like me and uh, Bernard Schultz and Cliffville and so on. So how this all happened was this way. I mean, I know this man for something like 25 years. Actually more than 25, 25 years personally, but more than actually 25 years, uh, maybe a couple of years before that. And, uh, and the reason is this, that there was a certain problem actually. It was the, uh, it was what you call calculating the quasi-normal modes of a black hole. The black hole rings like a bell, but it, it rings with certain frequencies which are, which are called quasi-normal modes. And these quasi-normal modes, what are these frequencies? They are complex frequencies in the sense that there is not only a vibration, but they decay the certain rate. So, uh, so we are calculating this, uh, this, uh, this frequency and Chandrasekhar uh, with his uh, whole group, okay, there, was a, there was a lever there, there was a post of lever and other students, they were actually uh, very much engaged in calculating the quasi-normal modes. So they had done a certain calculation, but uh, we mean, uh, I, uh, I mean Bernard Schultz, Cliff Will, and there was a postdoc who was uh, also Japanese, I think, and myself. I mean. So there was an idea that we could do this in a simpler way. I mean, when Chandrasekhar did something, he always did it very rigorously. Okay, I mean, with all lots of calculations and things like that. And uh, so he had obtained a certain set of modes. And we did it in a different way using what is called the Bohr's of friend condition and using WKB approximations and things. And we got a different set of results. And uh, so for a while, these things did not match. And uh, then there was in 1990, I think, there was a, a meeting, what we call the Scientific Advisory Board or Scientific <coughs> Advisory Committee, which comes to Ayuga to see how the science progressing and so on, and advising on the, on the science. So this committee contained, had Chandrasekhar as one of the uh, people on this thing. So he came here and at that time I met him and I told him, I mean I discussed with him this problem. So as uh, we do the same, so these modes, take these first two and my matching but not the other, the higher one. So, he's, uh, so I told him that there's a discrepancy between the results. So he said I am right. <laughs> We are right. I mean, I don't know what you are doing, but we are right. And it turned out, of course, he was right. But anyway. <laughs> so later on, I mean, we didn't know what to, what was the problem. And the problem actually the, the WKB approximation, which was not very accurate. And he was actually, I think Bernard should employ the right person actually for this purpose. He was a, he's a student of Proven and Proven, who were experts on all complex WKB methods and mathematical methods and so on. They have a book, Complex WKB Methods and so on. And he actually solved the problem by calculating going to higher orders and things like that. So that's the first time I came to know about it. And I think it was in the conference in Argentina, Cordoba, where I saw a poster was put up there. So that's the first time I know him. And so he's an expert on all these things, complex WKB, perturbations, black holes, and things like that. Uh, and he has been, uh, uh, you know, working on these things like the oscillations of neutron star, black holes, how they would they emit gravitational waves, and things like that. So, so that's his sort of introduction, which I wanted to say that he is, in fact, the master in all this. And uh, also, the another thing which is there that he has a flair for popularizing science. And I recommend that book which is written there, you can see it there, A General Wizard, which gives the, uh, you know, life, uh, life and history of Einstein. I have read it and found it uh, very entertaining, actually. So, today with this Introduction. I would like to invite uh, Professor Neil Anderson, and I welcome you very much to Ayuka for this uh, uh, for this short period. Thank you.
Um, thank you for that. I'm not sure if I should be grateful for that story or not. It, it says a few things. It said back, back in, in the Stone Age, way before those of you that are students and postdocs and whatnot today were born, or even, you know, maybe even your parents. Uh, in those days, I did something to sort out something that apparently was a problem, but then didn't turn out to be a problem at all. So what I did was actually totally irrelevant. Um, so thank you for that. I, I have been here before, not in this room, but I've been to Ayuka before, but we figured out it was 20 years ago, so that was also probably before you were born. So this is not looking good for me. I'm basically downhill, you know, career is over, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, um, I'll do my best to take, take you through um, the next uh, hour or so. Uh, it will be a, um, a journey through space and time, I think. I'm starting with space and time, and I'm going to try to end with um, basically what I personally think of as the edge of physics as we know it. So we're going to go some distance, and it will take some time, so that's space and time. Um, <coughs> basically, I'd like to start by thinking back. And I'd like to think back, it's not uh, very far back, but I'd like to think back to something like the 1950s, which is, believe it or not, before I was born. Right? Maybe, maybe not you. No, no, no. no. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so if you go back to the 1950s and you ask, um, Imagine we go on a journey, we meet the person from the 1950s, perhaps a scientist, and we ask this scientist, what is the universe? Maybe we'll ask an astronomer, because they obviously peek through telescopes, so they will see things and not see things. So what would the astronomer tell us? Well, the astronomer would tell us that the universe is a really, might be exciting in a way, but it's really boring. It's really quiet, nothing happens quickly. It's just the stars glide along the sky, the galaxies are born, but everything takes a long, long time. Okay? Now you pass through the 1950s into the 1960s, and you learn that this was all wrong. The universe is a violent place. Stars live and die in supernova explosions. Black holes are born. The universe itself was born in the Big Bang explosion and it's now accelerating due to something that we call dark energy. We call it dark energy because, frankly, we have no idea what it actually is. But dark energy sounds kind of a little bit Star Wars-y, maybe, you know? And so that's clearly the serious science coming through. <coughs> and so what we've learned is that the universe is not, not at all this quiet, serene place. It's something else entirely. And so, one very, very important part of this story, um, how we understand these observations, is due to Albert Einstein. And so to, that's going to be the topic. And what I'm going to try to do is take you from the beginning of Einstein's theories of relativity all the way to the kind of things that are happening right now. And as I said, how that takes us to the un an understanding of very fun foundations of, of physics. Okay. So that's what I'm going to hope. What I'm hoping to do. But in order to get there, we need to go back. Actually, what we need to do is switch this on. There's modern technology, probably invented in the 1950s. <coughs> we need to go back to 1905. Um, I like the picture of, uh, this is from uh, the clock tower in Bern, Switzerland. I like the picture of the clock tower. It's got a very ornate, old-style clock. Um, because Einstein's flat, which he lived in when he worked at the patent office, is somewhere up here. And so I imagine every morning he went off to the patent office to look at people's crazy inventions and to decide if they would work or not. He walked past this clock, and that had something to do with him deciding that time didn't work quite as Isaac Newton told us it did. And so in 1905, Einstein solved a problem that was very topical at the time. He solved the problem of um, a mismatch between Newtonian physics and electromagnetism. Basically, in Newtonian physics, if I throw a ball 
and I'm doing that running, the two velocities will add. If I try to do the same thing in like electromagnetism, I shine this laser pointer. If I'm running, it doesn't really matter. We will all see the light as moving at the same speed anyway. So that was the problem. <coughs> and he solved that by something called special relativity. So special relativity is a very simple, I say that, I shouldn't say that, it's a theory. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Those of you that understand it are very clever. Now that's the equally insulting. So I shouldn't have said anything at all. <laughs> okay. <coughs> special relativity is a theory that deals with objects in motion. And what it does is explains this mismatch between Newtonian physics and electromagnetism by one single assumption. And that single assumption is that the speed of light is always the same no matter how you measure me how you move when you measure it. So that's taken to be a, a law of nature. And if you work with this law of nature and you take it seriously, then you have to start asking questions like, okay, so how do I measure distance? How do I measure time? And what Einstein does, he imagines in a thought experiment that you can do all of these things with light. You can do it by bouncing light off of different things. So I can figure out how far away this light bulb up there is by shining the light, having it bounce back to me, measuring how much time did it take. I don't have to go anywhere. I did this kind of experiment I like. I don't have to go anywhere. I can stay here and be lazy. Okay? <coughs> and then what comes out of this is that space and time are not what we thought they were. If you, try, if you start moving fast at high velocities, you get funny effects. You get objects shrinking in the direction of travel, something we call length contraction. You get clocks that are moving clocks appearing to run slow, something we call time dilation. So we learn that everything we learned in school, that you can set up a, ro a, a sort of grid of rods to measure distance and use your clock to measure time and everyone will agree provided we set the clock to the same time to start with what time it is that that's all wrong space and time depend on how you're moving when you do the measurement okay. um, so what does this tell us it tells us that space and time are flexible they're not fixed number one number two they depend on who's doing the measurement you all have your own time, your own space. You don't have to agree with anybody. I guess that, that can work you know, if you don't like people. Okay, we also learn from Einstein's theory that energy and mass are basically the same. You all know the world's most famous mathematical equation, which is E equals mc squared. Right. It basically says energy is just mass, and then the speed of light, c, is thrown in to get the dimensions right. Okay. So that's going to be important a little bit later. So Einstein did all this. Um, people immediately accepted that this was good. Einstein got a promotion at the patent office. I don't think it was for special relativity, but nevertheless. Um, but he carried on working at the patent office. He didn't get a job at the university or anything like that. Clearly, special relativity was not important enough to, to gain that kind of recognition, although it probably should have been. So he carried on thinking um, about these theories, and he realized pretty much immediately that he'd caused himself a bit of trouble. So he'd fixed the mismatch between Newton's theory of Newton's laws of motion and electromagnetism, but he'd introduced the mismatch between Newton's theory of gravity and his new theory of relativity. Basically, he said, there is a speed of light, it's fixed, and his special relativity says nothing can move faster than light. Actually, that's not quite true. If you start out faster than light, you can never, never slow down below the speed of light. That's kind of a terrible place to be. You'd always have to be running as fast as you can. Um, whereas those of us that are lazy, we want to start off slow, and we can never exceed the speed of light. There is a speed limit. Um, but that's a problem because Newton's theory of gravity says that gravity, changes in gravity over here, let's take as an example two stars going around one another like this, the information about this happening is transmitted throughout the entire universe instantaneously, faster than the speed of light. So that can't happen. There is a problem. So Einstein started thinking about gravity, basically trying to see, okay, look, I seem to have broken this thing, how do I fix it? So the story goes that in 1907, after about two years of thinking, which is nothing for a theoretical physicist, I can tell you, um, 
Einstein was sitting in his patent office. I like to think that he was sitting there. He was a bit bored, you know, office work. Maybe he had the calculation peeking out through the drawer. The drawer is there. There's a calculation there, if you can see it. Um, and then he had what he describes as the best thought in his entire life. So Einstein's best thought was he was looking out the window and he saw a couple of window cleaners on the building opposite. And his best thought was, imagine one of them falling. Now, that's not the kind of best thought that you and I might have, but, uh, but we're not Einstein, so that, that's OK. Um, of course, he didn't think, imagine this man falling and smashing into the ground. And that, he didn't think about that. But he was thinking, imagine this man falling. And then he thought, again, it's a thought experiment. What if the man wasn't falling, but I was sitting in a chair with rocket boosters accelerating up my, upwards, and the man was just hovering there in space with no gravity? Okay? And then he made a very important realization, which is that if you take out all, everything else, and uh, we assume that the rocket boosters here are silent, a little bit of a, that's probably an idealization, but whatever. Um, you would not be able to tell the difference between these two situations. You would not be able to tell if the man was falling because of gravity, well, Einstein's sitting here on his seat, or Einstein was accelerating and the man was just floating. And that tells us that acceleration and gravity are the same. It's something we call the equivalence principle. Acceleration and gravity are equipment. So this is very, very important because that told Einstein that what he should be doing is not trying to figure out gravity on its own. He should try to figure out what happens if he added in acceleration to the previous theory. And that gave him an important clue as to where he should go. So that was the first part. The second part is building in this idea that light is lazy moving at a fixed speed, always taking the shortest path between two points. Right? So the second thought experiment I want to give you from Einstein has to do with the lift. So Einstein is in this lift. He accelerates again up from his office chair to very high speeds, close to the speed of light. And then he sees through a little hole drilled in the wall of the lift, say, a beam of light coming in. But because he's accelerating upwards, you can imagine, you know, the speed of light moves at the fixed, the light moves at the fixed speed like this. The lift accelerates upwards. But because it accelerates upwards, the light ray will appear to bend towards the floor. Okay? Provided he's close to the speed of light. Otherwise, you just see it, well, obviously, go straight through. So he thought about this, and he realized that if he wanted to explain why light would bend like that, then he could either think about the accelerating lift, or he could think about gravity, because we've learned that acceleration and gravity are the same. Right? And so gravity should bend light. But light is lazy. It likes the shortest path between any two points, so he came up with the idea that one way of achieving that would be to bend space, to allow the curved light to take the shortest path between two points. So that was the idea. In about 1907, Einstein had the equivalence principle. He had the curved space, or curved space time, because space and time belong together. And then he started calculating. And he calculated. And he calculated for eight years. Now, imagine that. Eight years, stop starts, going wrong, publishing papers that then he finds are full of mistakes. I can relate to that. And then in 1915, in one month, the month of November, he finished what we call general relativity. So general relativity basically says the shape of space and time, the geometry, depends on 
where the stuff is, the matter, and how the stuff moves. And that's written down in something, I'm not going to show you many equations because I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to show you this one because it's so very important. So this is called the Einstein field equations. There are a set of them. They all look like this. They're all in, in one shorthand description. There are things here you will recognize, even if you're not expert, like the number eight. Those of you that know a little bit mathematics probably know the number pi. If you don't know the number pi, maybe you'd like some pi. It's a very bad joke. I always make that. Okay? Then you have Newton's gravitational constant, because ultimately it's going to be gravity, and the speed of light, because we're talking about relativity. So we know we need these two things. And then we've got a mysterious object called T with some mu's and new indices here. That tells us where all the stuff is and how it moves. Our job as theoretical physicists, whatever we are, is to understand what this thing is and what we should put there. Okay? But it describes matter and how the matter moves. Over on the other side is something very pure. It doesn't have anything dirty like matter. It's just geometry. It's the shape of space and time combined. And so the theory says, if I change the geometry, I affect how things move, or if things move, they affect the geometry. Beautiful. So that's the theory of general relativity. Now it has predictions to come along with it, and that's what Einstein worked out in that month of November. So what did we have? We had the equivalence principle, acceleration and gravity are the same. We now have general relativity saying gravity is geometry. The combined space-time is not flat, it's curved. And the shape of space and time determines how things move. So what does this new theory of gravity do? What's it good for? Well, let's check. It moves mass. Apples still fall. Down. Check. It bends light. We talked about that already. That comes from the equivalence principle. It has to happen. That's new. It warps time. Clocks run slower when they're closer to the ground than at high altitudes. So Sanjeev mentioned Cliff Will. I've got a, a joke from Cliff Will. I'm going to do it because I like it. So you might not think about this in your everyday life, but your head ages as a different rate from your feet, meaning your head is, you know, gets tired at a different rate from your feet, and that's why you should spend most of the time lying down. Um, gravity creates black holes. I'm going to come to that in a minute, so let's not talk about it now. It makes waves. That's the main topic of this talk. We can come back to that. And it explains in some sense, the Big Bang and why the universe is expanding. So this theory does a lot. And in 1915, there was perhaps too much. So the question immediately became, how do you know that Einstein is right? How do we test him and how do we prove that this is all crankery and crazy stuff? Well, Einstein himself realized that this was going to be important of course, from the introduction, there are scientists that are convinced that they are right. And Einstein was certainly one of them. And so he would say, well, the theory is so simple and beautiful, it has to be true. Now, that is an argument, but I'm not sure that it's a very good argument. So anyway, Einstein had already calculated some things. For example, he had calculated the light bending due to gravity. Okay? And that was famously tested during a solar eclipse uh, led uh, by an expedition led by Arthur Eddington in 1919. You might know that story. The part of the story that you might not know is that Einstein had calculated this already in 1911 before he finished general relativity, he had made a prediction and he had convinced some astronomers that this could be measured and they should go and measure it. Okay? 
And so some people listen, and there was an expedition in about 1913 to the Crimea, some German astronomers, I believe, went to measure this effect. Now, they didn't complete that expedition because the World War broke out, so they were arrested and sent home. And that was kind of lucky for Einstein because his calculation was wrong by a factor of two. So what you can ask yourself is this. If they had made that measurement before Einstein actually finished general relativity, would that have knocked his confidence? Because they would have found that he was wrong. So was he, in fact, incredibly lucky that everyone else was unlucky with the war? I think it's an interesting, you know, of course, immediately after the war, there's some irony as well that there were British astronomers that proved that a German scientist was right. I think there's something beautiful about that. Okay. So let's take this uh, idea of light bending and let's run with it. So we know it works. So now you can ask, what happens if I bend space and time so much that light can't escape or the light starts going around in circles. Okay. Imagine, can I do that? Well, you can and you end up with something we now call a black hole. An idea that was really controversial from about 1915 when Carl Schwarzschild wrote down the first mathematical solution to Einstein's equations which turns out to describe a black hole but was misunderstood for about 50 years. So again, one of the big controversies in in physics is, are there black holes, yes or no? So I'm not going to talk much about black holes, but they will be very important as sort of partners in what's going to happen. 1916, Einstein started, continued to look at what his theory predicted, and he realized that if he wrote the equations in a certain way, gravity moved forward through waves. What does that mean? Well, it means that if I go back to these two stars going around one another, the way that the information moves out from that system is through waves. So gravity is a little bit like light that moves through electromagnetic waves. We also seem to have gravitational waves. Okay? So Einstein wasn't sure what to think of that idea, but he has, during his the years from 1916 onwards to his passing in 1955, he wrote papers saying, yes, there are gravitational waves. He wrote papers saying, no, there are no gravitational waves. And then he wrote a paper saying, well, maybe. So I think that covers all the possibilities quite nicely. Um, and other people continued to that discussion and carried on with yes, no, maybe, until, sadly, in a way, just after Einstein died, in the late 1950s, there's a, there's a famous conference at Chapel Hill in North Carolina where people made the argument as to why these waves would carry energy so they were real. You should be able to measure them. And that was still not convincing for everybody, but I think the sort of serious part of the community started believing that this is something we should be looking for. And then you can start asking, okay, so what, how do I know? Well, think about those two stars going around one another. They should lose energy, so they should be drawn gradually closer together because of the emission of these waves. How do I test that? But one way you could test it would be if you could very, very accurately measure two stars going around one another, but they have to be close together and they have to be heavy. They have to have sort of strong gravity and, you know, things have to happen on a human time scale, not sort of saying, if you measure it today, and we come back in 10 million years, it would have changed by some small fraction. You give that project to a PhD student, and they're going to look at you like you're a fool. So the kind of project you want is, you measure it today, and you do it again within your PhD period, so you have a chance of actually going forward as a scientist. Right? You learn from experience that you don't give PhD students or any students, for that matter, any humans, a calculation that say, oh, 
on in 10 lifetimes we're going to solve this problem. You start today, if you oh God, that, that's not very good. Okay? It's not very helpful. So um, what happened was there are these stars that are almost black holes. They're formed in a similar way to a black hole. When a star dies, it explodes. A big star dies, it explodes in a supernova. Uh, matter starts falling in. If there's too much matter, it can't stop. It just keeps on until it falls through uh, what we call the event horizon and forms a black hole. If you got a slightly less mass, it could stop halfway and form what we call a neutron star. And so we see these neutron stars often as what we call radio pulsars. They're like lighthouses. They have a magnetic field and they rotate. So they rotate around some axis and then the magnetic field is along some other axis. So you can see these sort of pulses sweeping across the sky, catch the pulses, and they're very, very precise. Some of these objects are more stable than the best atomic clocks that we can build. So these are amazing objects, about 10 kilometers across, no, 10 kilometers in radius, so 20 kilometers across, weighing about one and a half times as much as the sun. Okay? You can work out for yourselves that that density you need or you get is absolutely enormous. So I'm going to come back to that. Anyway, in 1974, a PhD student at the time was looking at data from the Arecibo radio telescope, and he found a very funny kind of system where there was some odd behavior in this pulse signal. And he figured out, together with his supervisor, Joe Taylor, that you could explain this if the star was, had a partner. So there were two stars going around one another, one that had pulses and one that did not. And then they said, well, if this is true, then we should be able to test this prediction about gravitational radiation. So they worked out, together with colleagues, what they should see and did some measurements. And indeed, the prediction of this system is spot on Einstein's theory. And now if you fast forward from the 70s to oops, the 2000s, go back from that for a moment, um, you see that the precision, these little dots here, are the measurements with error bars. And if you work out what this means, over here somewhere, we have tested the prediction that gravitational waves would leak energy from this kind of system to better than 1%. Now, if you know anything, anything whatsoever about astronomy, you know that astronomers are impressed if you get within what we call an order of magnitude, so a factor of 10, right? which is a 1,000%, which you obviously can't have. But there you go. Okay? So 1% is astonishingly accurate, why? which is why Russell Hulls and Joe Taylor won the Nobel Prize in physics, eventually, about 10 years later. Okay, so now let's ask what happens to this kind of system eventually. This is an indirect confirmation that Einstein was right. How do we test it really? Can we get our hands on this thing? Can we actually catch these waves? What does that mean? So in order to answer that question, we need to, first of all, fast forward this system and see what will it do eventually. What happens when gravity gets really strong? Because these waves should get stronger as the system gets closer. So here's an example of what happens next. Um, it comes from a simulation, a numerical simulation of solutions to those equations I showed you. This is the kind of thing it took about 20 years for people to go from the idea that we should do this to computers being good enough and we being clever enough to actually do it. So what you're going to see is a simulation with colors that represent the gravitational waves from two black holes, in this case, that go around one another. And at the same time, there's going to be sound that plays if you took this gravitational wave signal that reaches a point and you translated that straight into audio. It just so happens that this system is set up so that th you can hear this signal. Okay? So I'm going to play this once, and then I'm going to talk you through what actually happened. Okay? So you can see that the black holes are actually white, which is a, a trick. But it wouldn't be very good to have black holes in the black background. So now, let's listen.
Did you hear that? It's a little bit quiet. I see. Okay. So, the stars start out far apart, signal is quiet, and at low frequency. They get closer, a little bit stronger, frequency goes up. And then they come together, and it's quiet. So, this is what um, technically, technically is called a chirp because it sounds a little bit like a bat that flies towards you at high speed and then crashes into you so he goes silent, something like that. Um, what it tells you is that if you want to catch gravitational waves, you need to stop looking and start listening. So we need to stop looking through telescopes, trying to image things, and start listening to the universe, trying to think about why it is that radio is always going to be superior to television. That probably only works for my generation and older people. Younger people are say, what do you mean radio? What's that? OK, so uh, what does a gravitational wave do to an object that it passes through? Say, a person. So I should ask for a volunteer, and then I should demonstrate this, or I can just do it with a cartoon. Okay, so gravity is a tidal for interaction. It stretches and squeezes things. So that means that if a gravitational wave were to pass through someone, they will first be stretched, stretched, and then squeezed. So it would be some motion like this. It would be incredibly uncomfortable. Right? So we should just sit here, relax and feel the gravitational waves. Okay, That's your job. The problem is you have to meditate to very high precision to achieve this because the magic number as to how much a gravitational wave from the cosmos would stretch and squeeze you. The magic number is it will stretch you if you're one meter tall, which is maybe quite short, but say order one meter, it will stretch you by 10 to the minus 21 meters. Okay? This is ridiculously small. Right? I'm certainly not going to feel a stretching of 10 to the minus 21 of myself. Kind of, kind of lucky. Okay? But this is ridiculously small. Do you have any idea how small this number is? So let me give you, uh, well, you probably know 10 to the minus 21, so there's a 1 divided by a million, a billion, another billion, and you, you just keep on going, okay? so this is tiny. Okay? But how small is this in terms of actually measuring? Let's see. So I'm going to measure this with a ruler. I, I'm not going to do that, but let's say I'm going to measure this with a ruler. The ruler is made out of atoms. How big are the atoms? Well, they're not 10 to the minus 21 meters. They're much bigger than that. The nucleus of the atom is what we call a fermion. It's 10 to the minus 15 meters. So if I build some material object, and I'm going to try to do this, I'm trying to measure something that is give or take a million times smaller than the size of the smallest bit that makes up the thing that I'm measuring with. Good luck to me. So this clearly is ridiculous. It cannot be done. Right? You should just go home now. Okay? Anything you've ever read about this is just nonsense. So how do we do this? How do you beat this? Well, the answer is kind of in this little relation here. What you do, if you can't make something that for this being one meter, 10 to the minus 21 meters, you make this bigger. So you make the size of the thing big. Okay. Now, there are two important questions you need to think about. One, 
how big can I possibly make a scientific instrument? Okay? And two, who is going to pay for it? And then you try to balance these two, right? And the answer appears to be three kilometers. Okay? And so then you gain here a factor of about 1,000 that makes this 10 to the minus 18. That's still not quite there. So then you bounce the light back and forth a few times, and then you almost get to this. So you can get the feeling why you can maybe get it. Okay. It's not easy. I think this is probably, in science terms, one of the most awesome engineering challenges that people have ever faced. And then you think about someone paying for it. So scientists did this, the, what we now call the LIGO project, LIGO for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So the idea was to measure distance, as I said, with light, put a mirror over there on the wall, bounce a laser back and forth. This is now three kilometers. And then because I need to measure this stretching and squeezing, it's not enough to try one arm like that. I need to measure the difference between one like this and one like over there. Okay? So I measure stretching and squeezing like this. Okay? So the LIGO project was invented or something in the early 1980s. But the idea was that we should be able to do this using interferometer technology. The same kind of idea really that two guys called Michelson and Morley had used in the 1800s to conclude that the speed, basically that the idea that the Earth was not moving through some material called ether that led to special relativity. So interferometer is a sort of the relativity machine. Okay. Um, so they had this idea that you could do this, and then the question, of course, is can we actually do it, or are we just saying it? If we want the money, we need to convince people with money that we can do this, and that's never easy. You try to send in a scientist to convince someone with money that they should part with their money to do some science, not always a trivial exercise. Okay? So eventually, come the 1990s, this project actually got some money and got underway. And so the breaking point, I think, is in my mind, is about 1992. Incidentally, about the time that I did those calculations that Sanjeev was talking about. Um, so that was the beginning. Um, when the LIGO pro project got some funding and they started trying to think about how do we build this thing. And then um, they built the thing, worked on it, improved it, tweaked it, it got closer and closer to this number, and then they got to this number, and they saw nothing, or heard nothing. And then they said, oh yes, but you see, when you gave us this money, we didn't say really that we were going to see something. We just said we were going to build it, and it was going to be this good. That's all we did, really, honestly. Look, we made a cake, had this as a picture and just, you know, that was, that was what we were going to have cake. You gave us millions of dollars, most of it actually for baking out the vacuum system, so the electricity bill. But all we wanted was cake. However, if you give us some more money, <laughs> we'll make it a little bit better and then you'll see. Okay? But they're smarter than that, so I tweak the story a little bit. They already knew that they were going to get a little bit more money. So they didn't feel desperate when they didn't succeed at the first stage. But the truth is that they never really promised that they were going to start seeing things at that point. It was only a stopping point showing we can do this, we can build this. But you know, maybe, that if you build things like this, here it is, the LIGO Hanford instrument, three kilometers, four kilometers, sorry, and four kilometers this way. In here, there's a mirror, some lasers, some junk. And then there's some people that have to work here. Looks like a 
It is, I've been there, it's an exciting place. There's tumbleweed. You, you're excited by that. Some nuclear waste. Well, it's really it's a good holiday destination, I think. <laughs> Maybe that when they stop taking data with LIGO, they can sell tickets, you know. People can come, come and spend a the, spend the weekend in the vacuum tube. <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. So you have this instrument, you improve it, you hope that one day there will be some stretching and squeezing going on and that you will actually measure this. It would look something like this, vastly exaggerate, exaggerated, because this ratio is not 10 to the minus 15. You have some student, postdoc, whatever, sitting in the control room, and then one moment they go, what? What's that? Six months later, there's a press conference, and they did it. So what did they do? Well, they switched the machine on, or the instrument on, the two instruments, because there's two of them, another one in Livingston, Louisiana, always need two, because otherwise this wouldn't work. You wouldn't start such a noisy experiment that you would not trust the output from one instrument you had need two. They switched it on, actually before they switched it on, they caught the signal. So that's, they had switched it on, but they hadn't officially started taking data. Because so that's when you learn that the L in LIGO stands for lucky. <laughs> okay? Because before they officially switched it on, they caught the gravitational wave signal of two black holes coming together. And that signal was so strong that if you did a little bit of filtering, taking out the high and low frequencies, you can actually see it with the bare eye. Right? So the noise is very noisy, but you can see this chirp. The frequency goes up, so the wavelength goes becomes smaller. The amplitude goes up, just like in that thing we heard. And here is the other one, the other detector. Same thing, shifted by a few milliseconds in time and overlay them, you see they look the same. So the two instruments, different places, pick up the same thing as the first indication that you might have seen something. Then you work through the theory and you figure out that Einstein's mathematics is a bit strange. Okay? You learn, for example, is my favorite, so you learn that 36 add 29 and you get 62. That's the kind of thing that I try to explain to my daughter and she tells me to go away. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, what you're missing here are the units. That these are masses of the sun. So 36 times as heavy as the sun, add a black hole 29 times as heavy, and you get one that's 62 times as heavy. You lost three. So three times the energy equivalent of the sun has been radiated away as gravitational waves in a fraction of a second. Let's just think about that. Of course, my daughter takes a different tack. She says, but Dad, can I add in these missing masses of the sun whenever my calculations don't work out? Will the teachers buy it? And the answer, of course, is no. So the breakthrough before the advanced LIGO detectors really started um, and if you've followed this story, you know that we've seen more black holes coming together. There's been, I believe, now 10 in total in the first two runs of advanced LIGO. But I'm going to leave the black holes, wonderful as they are, and I'm going to go back to the question, what happens next? Well, the first thing that happens next is some people got a lot of money and gold medals. In fact, I believe everyone, even Sanjeev, got a medal, but not for the Nobel Prize, for something called the Breakthrough Prize. So loads of prizes. Ray Wise invented the technology. Kip Thorne told us what to do, why we should do it. And Barry Barish jumped in and saved the LIGO project in the mid-1990s when people were just fighting like mad. Um, so without him, they probably would have, could have collapsed at that time. So we're awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017. But when they were awarded the Nobel Prize, they knew that they had something even better up their sleeve. Although they didn't tell anyone. Really. So let's go back to these two neutron stars that we know from the double pulse, the binary pulsar I talked about. What are they? 
Well, this is where we get to the edge of physics. Let me go back to that first one. If you want to build a neutron star at home, what you need to do, oh, stop doing that, is take basically a herd of elephants and cram it into a volume like this. That gives you the kind of physics we need. What does that mean? Well, it means that you take the atoms and you squeeze them together until they're not individual atoms anymore. They're just the neutrons, protons, and electrons that make up the atoms in a ball. And you squeeze them so much, perhaps, that even they start touching and they become the quarks that make up the neutrons and protons. So this is the edge of physics as we know it. Okay? If you want to play this game and understand what these stars are and how they work, you need to learn gravity well, because otherwise the star won't be held together, it will fall apart. And I've told you that general relativity is really cool anyway. You need to understand electromagnetism because otherwise we wouldn't see these things as radio pulsars. So clearly they have magnetic fields. These magnetic fields are the strongest magnetic fields we know in the universe. You need something called the strong interaction. This is particle physics. Basically, this determines how many neutrons and protons do you have. What's the ratio between the two? Okay. That's an unsolved problem. That's the edge of how we understand nuclear and particle physics. And then you need something really pesky, which is called the weak interaction, which involves neutrinos. So neutrinos are given off when neutrons are converted into protons and electrons and vice versa. Okay? And these reactions determine how fast a neutron star cools from the moment when it's born, when it is at the temperature of something like a million million Kelvin is not very cold. Right? How it cools to something that's super cold at a hundred million Kelvin. At a hundred million degrees is cold for these guys. So these are crazy numbers. At 10 to the minus 21 is a crazy number. But here we're talking every single number is crazy. The strongest magnetic fields, hot is really cold, all these things. We're pushing physics as we know it. This is why any way of observing these objects, anything, any hint of this physics is inc incredibly valuable. So what will happen to the binary pulsar? Well, eventually, it's going to come together. Just like in that movie I showed you before, but not now without sound. So. The difference here is these are not two black holes. This is a simulation of two neutron stars crashing together. So there's stuff. And this thing here are not gravitational waves. This is a rendering of density. So this is the stuff. And if you look at these kinds of simulations, you learn a number of things that we should be looking for. You learn that the signal will look the same when they're apart. They will spiral together. Frequency goes up, amplitude goes up. Same rules apply because it's only gravity. They come together and it's a mess. Stuff is flung out. Some stuff is held in. It wobbles about in a crazy kind of fashion. And then it could collapse to a black hole. There's all sorts of things going on here. If you add magnetic fields to this, you may get outflows, something we call jets, which might, we think, trigger what we see as gamma ray bursts in X-ray telescopes and gamma ray telescopes. The problem is, these simulations uh, are not yet good enough to tie that all together. We're not able to do this. This little thing that I show you here, It doesn't last very long. It doesn't look very impressive. Compared to the CGI you see in cinema, this is rubbish. The most boring movie ever. But this took months on one of the largest supercomputers we have. So this is the best we can do. It's not Hollywood or Bollywood or anything. But this is the best we can do. 
that's our lack of imagination, I think, you know. There are no superheroes, no... But we're working on it. So, um, can we do this? Well, again, L is for Lucky and for LIGO. So here is the August last year event. You have the gravitational wave signal followed by a flash in gamma rays less than two seconds later. The flashing gamma rays indicate that there was an explosion, there was matter, and then there was emission across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays, X-rays, radio, optical. Because the third gravitational wave instrument, the Virgo detector in Italy, had started taking data at the beginning of August. And because that instrument didn't really see this signal, the gravitational wave signal, very strongly, people were able to say, well, that means the source has to be in a blind spot for that detector, but not the other two. And that means you could tell it where in the sky this would be. And that allowed astronomers to point the telescopes. That's very, very important because the sky is big. And telescopes look at tiny little parts of the sky. So they could point the telescopes in the right direction. And that meant that they caught all these things. So here's a, an image of when these observations were seen, were taken. Okay? So it was seen close to a galaxy. So it means that we know the distance of this galaxy, we know the distance of this event, and we can start working out a lot of things. We can work out, does the gravitational wave signal move at the same speed as light? Because the electromagnetic explosion arrived pretty much at the same time as the gravitational wave signal. So they must move at pretty much the same speed, and that constrains our other theories of gravity quite severely. Uh, we can work out the distance to this object, and we can do it in different ways. We can do it through the redshift of the light from the galaxy, and we can do it through the gravitational wave signal on its own, and that allows us to put, for the first time, using gravitational waves, a constraint on something called the Hubble constant, which tells us how fast the universe is expanding. And that is important because it points to a new way of measuring distances in cosmology. It tells us for sure that there is a connection between the gamma ray bursts, which we've seen since the 1950s, and the merger of two neutron stars, something that we have had as a hypothesis, but we didn't have the proof. Now we have an example of that being true. So it tells us an enormous amount of things about physics. It doesn't tell us everything. It doesn't, for example, tell us what happened to the matter when the objects came together, because that happens in a frequency range that's just outside where the detectors were sensitive at that time. So there's much more to do. There's much to be excited about for what happens next. But this is an example of where we were always hoping to go. We were always hoping and dreaming all those years ago when we were doing these silly calculations on gravitational waves and things. We were always hoping that one day we would be accepted by the astronomers. Right? We were the people fiddling with Einstein's theory of relativity that no one really cared about. Right? Black holes here, yeah, forget about that. Gravitational waves, that number, 10 to the minus 21, was so ridiculous that it was going to be impossible. It didn't really matter what we thought. But this event changes the game completely. And you should not be surprised if now those astronomers that were so skeptical for decades love the idea of black holes and gravitational waves. Because this gave them something that they did not have before. And maybe the most interesting thing from their point of view is he told them 
where the heavy elements come from. He told them that all the gold in the universe comes from neutron stars crashing into one another. All the material, the material is flung out, undergoes rapid nuclear reactions to form heavy elements like gold and platinum. Of course, if you write newspaper headlines, the idea that you've done a bit of science that explains where all the gold comes from, that's something, isn't it? I guess the next thing we want to know is, can we use the gravitation waves to get gold? <laughs> but that's probably for some other day. Okay, I think that's, that's it from me, pretty much. Um, I hope I've managed to explain some of the wonderful ideas in this area, how we've come a long, long way from the beginning of the 1900s through to detections with LIGO, opening up a new kind of astronomy, and perhaps explain to you why we're so very excited about LIGO starting up again next year, why there's reason for those of you young enough to look to the future, not 20 years ago to the past, why you should be excited about this, why in India you should be excited because l there is going to be a LIGO instrument in India and you can all be part of that, you can make it happen. And I think maybe there will be challenges that will need people to make it happen. Because you know, this is not easy. Those of you that are really young can look forward to the 2030s, when we might have an instrument like this in space, something called LISA, which will detect all the white dwarf binaries or in the galaxy, or many of them, that will be detect heavier black holes crashing together. Maybe in the meantime, we'll use this radio astronomy to look at pulsars and use the timing from pulsars as a gigantic gravitational wave detector to see the biggest black holes, the beasts at the center of galaxies that weigh maybe a billion times as much as the sun coming together. So this is science over something like 30 decades in frequency using all sorts of natural tools like pulsars to instruments we built, instruments we hope to build. So there's a bright future, provided we continue listening. So at that point, I'll thank you. few slides before this one. Yes. Uh, you had shown uh, that after the merger of the two neutron stars, uh, the different wavelengths uh, that right. were observed. Mean, Can uh, you bring that up, please? Uh, this yeah, one. This one. Yeah. Uh, so I had two, three questions. Yes, that's fine. So one is that uh, you know, starting with gravitational waves all the way down to the radio waves. Yes. Uh, we see that uh, as the wavelength increases, uh, <coughs> the uh, detection was a little later. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question uh, here is that uh, the exception seems to be the UV uh, right. radiation. Right. So uh, what is the peculiarity there? OK, so um, I think that um, you, you can read it like that but it's probably not the way that it works. What you need to ask yourself is where do these different emissions come from, okay? So the gravitational waves come from the in-spiral and the merger, and then they're gone. Right? The uh, gamma ray flash that we see involves probably outflows of material and a burst of energy along some axis. Okay? That to wind the system up to get that triggered will take a little bit of time. We don't know how long because you can't simulate it, as I said, but apparently it doesn't take more than a couple of seconds. 
And then the question is, are these gamma rays coming from near the object, or does, do you, does it come from somewhere, some distance where the information that this merger has happened has to travel out first? Okay. So that gives you a little bit of a delay. The X-rays don't come from close, of, close to the object at all, because that region is too messy. It comes from a vast region when the material is thrown out, crashes into the interstellar medium, and the X-rays are created. Similarly, the UV comes from the mater matter that's thrown out, that shines as it undergoes these radioactive reactions. And that happens earlier than some of the other things. And the radio ap apparently comes from even larger distances. So one has to think about where do these things happen and how is the information that the stars came together, matter came out, how is that information Trans transmitted from one region to another. And this gives us a clue as to that hierarchy of things, but we don't know how to model all of them together. So that's why it's difficult to piece this. You know, I can't do this on the computer. Yeah. Uh, then, <coughs> you know, on what basis uh, does it get decided that uh, this component of the, like, the accelerating masses when they are losing energy. Uh, the total energy lost, so how much of it will be radiated as gravitational waves and how much uh, as electromagnetic? Ah, okay. So gravity wins in the beginning. And we can work out fairly precisely how much energy is emitted up to the point when the stars touch, right? That's a textbook kind of calculation, more or less. Um, to work out the next part, it de really depends on what happens next, okay? Now, there are two extremes. One is that the object is too heavy to stay as a star. It collapses immediately to a black hole, in which case we probably know quite well as well how much is going to be radiated as energy, because there's no matter involved, right? But in between it gets messy, because in between you can imagine this object sort of sloshing about like, you know, something you've kicked that wobbles, and if it lives for a long time, it can lose a lot of energy that way. And then when it comes to how much electromagnetic emission you get, it depends on, again, something we don't really understand, which is how strong is the magnetic field of this object? And that's complicated because you get this extremely dense matter going around. The magnetic field will twist and turn and wind itself up. And we don't really know exactly how that works. Because again, we can't resolve in the numerical simulations exactly what we need. And we don't probably represent the magnetic field exactly as we should. We are improving on this. This is the kind of thing that people, this cutting edge of what people are working on, trying to do, but it is very, expensive computationally, it is quite difficult. So those are really good questions, but there is a reason why we don't know yet. So that's, you can see why observations like this are incredibly important, because they help guide us to where, you know, when a simulation predicts something, it helps guide us to what might the real answer be. Yes. Uh, excellent question. So, I will give you two examples. Uh, when the LISA uh, mission flies in the 2030s, one of the key things that the LISA mission wants to capture is something we call extreme mass ratio in spirals. That's essentially tiny objects like neutron stars or small black holes going around the big black hole like in the center of the galaxy. And why do we want to do that? We want to do that because as this little object goes around the big black hole, it traces out the geometry of space-time. So we can test very accurately if the black hole, that the big black hole, is the kind of black hole that we're predicting with Einstein's theory or something different. Right? That's number one. Number two, the next big thing for LIGO stands for LOCKEY is going to be a mixed system 
where a neutron star falls into a black hole. And that's very interesting for a number of reasons, but one being they can also lead to gamma ray bursts, so that's interesting for astronomy. The other one is that it will tell us, perhaps, the size of the neutron star. And that's still something that we are debating. Again, the LIGO detections helped us put constraints on the size of neutron stars, this, this, this event here. But if we start seeing mixed objects, because the black hole will try to rip the star apart if it's too big, whereas if the star is too small, it might fall in without being destroyed first, those kinds of observations might give us a, another angle on how big is a neutron star, which tells us really how does the physics inside work. Okay? So that's a, an excellent question, and those are things that are very exciting for the future. I so wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I don't know. But let me give you two options. Right? One is simple. I don't know. But it takes, it takes some, some time, time to trigger and launch a gamma ray. So whatever it is that does this job, and we have ideas but no proof that this actually works, because we can't do this on the computer. Okay? Whatever it does, it takes some time. You can imagine winding something up and the spring doesn't give until you wind it up enough, and that might take just two seconds. Easy. I've answered the question by not answering anything. <laughs> if you want to be more extreme, you say, well, you know, it actually happens at the same time, and it just happens <coughs> that light travels at a different speed. Easy. Only that probably doesn't work. So you can start saying, but the problem is that if gravity and light don't move at the same speed, if gravity is a little bit slower, for example, then this time difference could be different from what we're seeing in reality, right? Uh, the time, I mean, by the creation, the generation of the two signals, and then we don't know. So there's unknowns here that, at play that we can try to put constraints on, but because we can't do this in our sort of computer laboratory, we don't know. So that's, again, for people that are getting into this piece of science, those are excellent questions to think about. They have to be answered in the future. What type of wave is uh, gravitational wave? Transfers, uh, transfers or uh, longitudinal? Okay, so the answer is in the stretching and squeezing. It's transverse. It moves like this, transverse wave. So in Einstein's theory, there's two kinds of transverse wave. It's this stretching and this stretching. Okay? Like that and like that. We call them, we're very imaginative, we call them plots and cross. So that's Einstein's theory. Now if you take some other theories of gravity, you can think of there are theories with more polarizations where there's also a transfer or a longitudinal component. There is that if you add scalar theories, scalar fields to Einstein's gravity, you get something called a breathing mode, which is a spherical thing where it stretches in all directions at the same time and squeeze. So you could have other polarizations as we call them. And one of the things you would like to do, in fact, one of the things that LIGO has tried to do, but not just put limits on this, is are there other stretchings and squeezings going on? If there are, then Einstein's theory is wrong or incomplete. So that belongs to the sort of testing. Can we rule out alternative suggestions for how gravity works? Right? Can we rule out, for example, the existence of extra dimensions? as predicted by, for example, string theory. Right? In principle, you can put constraints on many of these things using gravitational waves. The question is, 
are the effects big enough to be distinguished when you already do in an experiment that so incredibly has such incredible precision, right? We need, might have you have to add extra precision on top of this because this 10 to the minus 21 is really small, right? But those are important questions that people are working on to try to put constraints on these other other theories because we'd really like to know. Some of us would really like Einstein to be, continue to be right well over a hundred years, having predicted all these things. Remember, he pre came up with general relativity before we had any idea that there were black holes or gravitation or anything. It all comes from Einstein's theory, which is a creation of his mind and mathematics. Right? His theory has passed every single pre test so far. Right? We have no evidence that general relativity is wrong. We know it's wrong right? because it doesn't match with quantum physics. So at some point we know if his scales are small and gravity is it's wrong. But in terms of classical physics, general relativity is the thing. Right? So some of us, would have, myself included, would like general relativity to prevail always. Right? But some people are more revolutionary. They'd like to say, well, look, I'm going to prove that guy wrong. <laughs> some of those people are crazy. Some people are serious. Right? And at some point, we should find evidence that general relativity breaks down. The question is, when? So a very important set of questions is, can you use observations, experiments, to test gravity to show where it breaks? Right? But that's hard. Again, something for that, some point in the future. For example, if the black holes that we see are not the black holes that we calculate, and there are theories that suggest why that should be the case, then we prove Einstein's theory incomplete. Right? So more black holes, which we should get starting next year, um, might eventually provide some evidence. And maybe I can go back to um, from May, where we started with the introduction. What happens when two black holes come together is they ring down in these quasi-normal modes that were mentioned. Quasi-normal modes, incidentally, were first discovered by an Indian scientist called Vishweshwara in the late 1960s. Um, and there, was, there has been a hint in the first black hole detection of that signal. But it was very weak. Hopefully, we'll do better in the future. They should do better in the future. So we'll start seeing this. And it's a very characteristic fingerprint of a black hole. But if it looks different, if the frequencies are somehow different from what we're calculating, that might be the evidence that these are not exactly the black holes that we thought they were. So that, I think, is something that should happen, you know, on sort of human lifetime, maybe even PhD student kind of three-year time scale. Okay. okay. I think I don't see any other hand up, so I will ask the last question. Oh, I see. I didn't plant this. <laughs> Doing this up his own, you know. So, uh, you said that L4 LIGO is lucky, obviously. I'm not allowed to say that, it was recorded. <laughs> I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> now, in the first observation run, we got the two black holes. Yes. In the second one, we got this. Now, as you know, we are very excited that in two months, the third observation run is going to start. And you already kind of answered this in passing, that what, which detection will make you think that LIGO is lucky again. Oh, the black hole neutral star. The black hole neutron star? Absolutely. OK, let's see whether we see a black hole neutron star in LIGO's third observation run. Did, do I get any money? <laughs> <laughs> So LIGO is looking for many, many different things. They're all exciting in their own way. But the mixed black hole neutron star system is something we really don't know. You have to understand, we knew there were double neutron star systems. We've known since the 1970s. Old story. OK? 
Okay? We know they should eventually crash together. We can work this out. It should happen. Uh, you have to be lucky for it to happen just at the right time when you've got three instruments, you can point in the sky, etc. That's lucky. The, the event, August event, was much closer than any previously observed gamma ray burst by some margin. That's lucky. You can just add these things. Or maybe there's so many of these, we just don't see them because we don't know where to point the telescope. We'll find out, I think, in the next observing month. But then there are other things, but we never knew there were going to be double black hole systems. By seeing them, we're starting to probe how, does the, how do stars end their lives? And that's a very important question for some of us. Okay. How are black holes formed? What masses do they have? How big do they get? Right. Those are important questions. And there were people not long ago that predicted that the number of black hole pairs that crash together in, that will be seen by light <laughs> was zero. And these were not crazy people. These were serious suggestions that these systems could not form. Okay? Now we're learning that there's tons of them. There's maybe too many of them. We're going to see so many, we're going to get bored. <laughs> we're going to get to the point where people don't even talk about them. Because how LIGO saw another black hole. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. Black hole and neutral star system, do they form? We don't know. What happens when they come together? We don't really know. It depends on how different they are in masses. Okay. Depends on how big the neutron stars are. There are questions here we'd like the answers to. So that's why I think that would be a that would be a nice thing. But you know, the question is, do you want it just after you switch on, or just before you switch off, or do you want it somewhere safe in the middle? What do you, how are you going to play it? Well, like yeah. reasonable amount of time. Oh, good. good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, but you know, hopefully. Hopefully. Okay. So let's thank uh, Neil again for the exciting talk. And as you know, we have a lot of programs here, and then you can uh, stay tuned to see more of this coming. Uh, I don't know whether we'll have another Gravity Wave lectures this uh, year now, but hopefully uh, next year. But there will be many programs which are there on our website, and you can uh, uh, stay tuned. All right, good night.